Okay, great. Um, I have, let's see, 901. This is the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. This enforcement committee meeting is being held by teleconference under the government code section 11133. The date is December 3rd, 2021, and the time is 9.01 a.m. The members of the public that are listening and would like to provide public comment by telephone will be limited to two minutes unless at the discretion of the board, circumstances require a longer period. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their allotted time to other members of the public to make comments. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio recorded. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. And we will now take roll call of the committee. Dr. Adams, um, would you please call the roll? Yes, Chairman Paris, um, uh, Dave Paris, DC, present. Vice Chair, Lawrence Adams, DC, present, Raphael Sweet, present. The committee is all present. Thank you. Um, moving to agenda item number two, approval of the October 16, 2020 meeting minutes. I will make a motion to approve the October 16, 2020 committee meeting minutes. Is there a I second? I will second the motion. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Um, I did have a, a quick question. In, in the meeting minutes, it's noted that the uh, Department of Consumer Affairs was launching an expert witness program to review and evaluate, and that they were it was placed on hold due to COVID-19. Uh, is that, have they restarted that, and is it up and completed? I haven't, re as far as I know, it hasn't resumed yet. Um, it's still on hold, so um, we're moving forward with ours, and um, we will, monitor what the department does because if they have um if they're doing something that can benefit us that maybe they can help us with or if they're doing something that we want to borrow you know whatever um process they're using um we can always do that but for right now i'm not aware of the department moving forward on theirs okay thank you um and then i had one other question under the update on the enforcement program statistical data we I had asked if it was possible to see the data as a percentage of the audits for the CE audits, um, the failed CE audits, and uh, just as a reminder, like I don't know if we we move that um, forward or not. But. Kristen, is that is that something we have or can do? Um, we we've, we've gathered those statistics for the Sunset Review report. Um, and we can also begin when we resume the audits, um, we can also include that information. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Moderator, can we open for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will go ahead and open up the Q&A panel. And if any member of the public wishes to make a comment, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, we have a request for comment from Marcus Strutz. Uh, Marcus, you'll have two minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning. And Marcus, you should be able to unmute yourself. All right, Marcus, you should be able to unmute yourself now. All right, so Marcus is uh, indicating that he cannot unmute himself. Uh, so we're gonna go to the next request for comment, which is Victor Tom. 
So Victor, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go, you're unmuted. Hello, yes, this is Victor Tong. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, it looks like Victor may have accidentally muted himself again, so we're going to try that a second time. Victor, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go, you're unmuted. All right. Uh, I would like to bring up an issue so that the board member can further discuss the uh, video conference uh, requirements starting in uh, January 2022. All right. Right now, as we have the letter received from the state board, there seems to be some potential violation of the American Disability Act when people are having medical condition and cannot attend the live seminar. And I myself have some staff member that are teachers that are having renal transplant and back surgery in the last year, and they would like to continue to work but not able to do so, while they would get the distant learning seminar uh, uh, approved, but that would dramatically decrease their income and the capability to earn their living. And that may be a form of discrimination. And I thought that it might be something that we need to have the board to discuss and address that issue. And it is not just affecting my staff member, but I'm sure that the uh, licensee in general would have the same kind of uh, impact and feelings too. So I would like to have the board to really find a solution between the finalized uh, board regulation is changed permanently. All right, thank you. And uh, I did see that Marcus got unmuted for a brief time. So Marcus, I'm gonna see if you can unmute yourself again. There you go, you are unmuted, uh, Marcus. Hi, good morning to everyone. So I, I would make a public comment in light of the fact that the DCA is terminating the CE internet-based waiver as of the end of this month. And uh, as someone who has many, uh, over a thousand people have responded, 99% of the chiropractors surveyed uh, would like to have live requirements to be done in person or via uh, internet-based Zoom. 97% in our survey think technique uh, should be taught via Zoom as well as an option. And 77% of the constituents of the chiropractic community have legitimate concerns about going back to live seminars in January because of COVID. As we know, COVID's getting worse and worse, and now we have another variant coming up. So the request is to put this on the agenda item for the December 16th board meeting. And we ask that the chiropractic board expedite the approval of internet-based CE as a permanent option for live CE and get it pushed through the OAL as fast as possible. And also that the board uh, ask the DCA to immediately reinstate the current waiver, uh, which they have the power to do. So it's just simply get a hold of the Department of Consumer Affairs and reinstate the waiver for CE internet based that we've had for the last year. Uh, thank you so much. Moderator, can we, we remind uh, members of the public that um, the comment is with respect to agenda item two, approval of the meeting minutes, and that they'll have an opportunity to offer any additional recommendations to the committee when we get to agenda item seven or eight? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and we have a question from one of the attendees just asking if they can see the other attendees. And um, it is not, it's a limitation of this meeting software that if you are attending as a member of the public, you cannot see other attendees. So I apologize for that. That's just a software limitation. And then we have um, a Thomas Classy. Thomas, I will give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and please uh, remember that we are only making comments on the meeting minutes. So Thomas, you should be able to unmute yourself if you have a comment about the minutes, meeting minutes. Okay, I don't, oh, there we go. Thomas, you're unmuted. Yes, I have no comments about the meeting minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Any further, I, I, just, sorry, go ahead, Robert. Oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to interrupt for a second. Um, if um, 
if the board members and um, Jason, if you could identify yourself before you speak, because um, this this gets recorded and then the staff use this for to record the, or to write the minutes. And um, so if they're not familiar with the voices, they they don't know who's speaking. So if, if everybody could try to um, identify themselves prior to speaking. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Any further discussion on agenda item number two by the board members? Uh, okay, hearing none, Dr. Adams, uh, will you please call for the vote? Got to unmute myself. That usually helps. <laughs> on the matter, on the matter of approval of the October October 16, 2020 minutes, Dr. David Paris. Yes. Lawrence Adams. Yes. Raphael Sweet. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, moving to agenda item number three. Um, staff will present to us a proposed recruitment timeline for subject matter expert for the board's enforcement program for review and discussion. Uh, Robert, who are you doing that or is? Um, Kristen, are you taking that? Yes, I will. Thank you. Okay, thank um, you. So for the past few years, the committee has been working with staff to enhance our expert witness selection process, including the criteria, standards, training materials, and application. Um, at this meeting, uh, staff is requesting the board's authorization to initiate the recruitment process for additional experts for our enforcement program. And we've put together a proposed timeline for our recruitment efforts, um, beginning with posting the recruitment announcement in January and beginning to accept applications. Um, a submission deadline of February 15th. And then um, we tentatively expect to conduct some, to have the enforcement committee conduct virtual interviews with the qualified applicants in March and a training session or two in April. Um, but that timeline of course is, um, is open to adjustments if necessary. But what we're looking for is um, the committee to discuss um, this timeline and um, consider making a recommendation to the board to um, authorize us to initiate the recruitment process. Thank you. Uh, any discussion from the board? I have a, a, a go ahead, Dr. Adams. I was just going to say I, I in reviewing the uh, minutes for today's meeting, it, uh, I thought it looked great and um, I, I I think we've had discussions in the past about, you know, our expert witnesses and some of the limitations there. And I think this is, uh, I think this is great and um, good job staff. Thank you, Dr. Um, Adams. Yeah, I like yeah. it. I think, I think it's a concise timeline. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if we are considering having this um, calendar as an annual recruitment period for us in an ongoing recruitment effort. Um, yes, um, I I think we should, and I, I invite Kristen to jump in here too. Um, do it annually, and with uh, with the technology that's available to us now, with WebEx and Zoom, Teams meetings, we can. Um, a lot of this stuff has become more efficient, so we could potentially do it even more frequently um, or on an as needed basis if we need somebody with a particular um, specialty or expertise and we don't currently have somebody in our pool with that. Um, we could um, we could do a special recruitment and bring people on, um, you know, quicker um, on an as needed basis. So there the potential to to do this um, on whatever schedule they the board or the committee wants um, is there now. But at least annually. <laughs> I had one other question. Um, I recall in um, this is Dr. Adams uh, in reviewing uh, 
some paperwork early on with uh, with orientation to the board. If somebody was previously on the board and has now been off the board for a year, are they eligible to be utilized by the BCE for expert consultation or in consultation? Um, yes, they are. And um, Jason, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't believe there's any um, any waiting period or so after somebody's on the board. Um, I don't think there's a year um, that they have to wait before they could serve the board as an expert. Um, but uh, there, at least there's nothing in the law that says they have to, but um, I'll defer to Jason on that. Jason, are you on mute? Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. Thanks. Um, I believe there is a, a one year waiting period. Um, I'd need to research that a bit further. That's something I could look into. Um, I, I know there are specified exemptions. I just don't know them offhand, um, but I could certainly get you an answer at the next board meeting, Dr. Adams. Well, yeah, I, I, I just remember reading. I don't know the member of the context, but I thought it was somebody who had been on the board had to wait a year before they could do some sort of consulting because Expert witnesses, I understand, are paid by the board, so therefore, you know, you have um, you have to have that time lapse. But yeah, the the one year um, of, they think they call it the revolving door policy is for um, from my understanding is when somebody leaves the board, they can't lobby the board on behalf of another entity. So if um, if you who went to work for the California Chiropractic Association and then wanted to lobby the board on an issue. Um, you can't do that for one year, but um, I don't know if that applies the other way where you can't come back and serve the board in another capacity. But but yeah, definitely um, if you're if you're doing it on behalf of somebody else, you have to wait a year. Thank you. Thank you. And just out of curiosity, does this differ from how we've recruited experts in the past? Uh, yes, it does. Um, the um, we in the past, I mean, we did what we did is we had um, periodic. It wasn't um, it's like maybe every other year we would um, do a recruitment. We would have um, we would go through the applications and screen out anybody who um, didn't qualify, and then um, then we would um, schedule trainings. One in and these were in person. One in Southern California, one in Northern California, and um, and so um, anybody who attended the training was eligible to be an expert after that. Um, so we've we've introduced here a more robust screening process, um, and and also tech, we're um, we're implementing the. Um, where they um, where have the written exercise and and also interviews with um, board or committee members. So um, so it's we're doing a much more thorough screening process too. Because in the past we because we didn't have that screening process, we would wouldn't find out until we used an expert if there were um, issues with their ability to write a good report. Or um, so so we're um, trying to make sure that we don't um, find out the hard way. Very good. And just FYI, um, Tammy, that that was um, Mr. Sweet um, who asked that question. <laughs> Sorry about that, Raphael. That's okay. No, I'll, no Thank problem. You. I, I'll um, I'll just provide that if somebody forgets. Uh, Dave Paris here. Um, so, do we anticipate the DCA might produce through their program that's on hold for COVID? Do we anticipate they might produce some like standardized? Um, interview questions for the when the members of the enforcement committee conduct the interviews. That would be our March. Uh, you know, I don't know, Kristen. Do you know if that's something that they're doing? I mean, that um, I don't. I don't recall that being one of the items that was included. Um, the idea was that they would be developing. Um, it was more the expert witness um, training materials and um, guidebook type of material. So I don't think they were planning to um, create any interview questions, but that's something that we can 
we can work on uh, with the committee for these um, interviews that we'll be conducting. Okay, okay. and uh, if I might suggest then too that maybe um, in this agenda item or maybe later we uh, get a doodle poll going or something so we can schedule that March 20, 2022 date now since we're closing in on uh, 90 days or so. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Okay, so I'm not sure if we need a motion, but I'm gonna make one. Uh, so I'm gonna make a motion um, to recommend to the full board that it authorize board staff to initiate the recruitment process for subject matter experts for the board's enforcement program in January, 2022, uh, per the schedule noted in the agenda. Is there a second? I'll second that. Yeah, sorry. Dr. Adams. Thank you. A any further discussion from the board? Okay. Anything else to add from staff? Anyone? Okay. Moderator, can we open this up for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm opening up the Q&A panel. And if any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item three regarding expert witnesses, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, I see no request for comment at this time. Mr. Chair, shall I close the, oh, I spoke too soon. We've got some. All right, so we have uh, Dr. Philip Rink that would like to make a comment. So Dr. Rink, you should be able to unmute yourself. And this is for agenda item three. Okay, you're Thank unmuted. You. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Good, good morning, panelists. Um, I want to comment on this issue uh, regarding the expert witnesses uh, and, and how they're used. Uh, we've had uh, some problems in the past with some expert witnesses. I know some of the uh, deputy attorney generals uh, in certain areas um, have been unhappy with some of the experts with their lack of knowledge of the terminology and the law pertaining to specific definitions like negligence, uh, incompetence, et cetera. Um, I would like to uh, offer my services to help the board to, if you wish, to have uh, uh, the ability to write certain questions or um, uh, examples of what each of these types of law violations could consist of. So if you'd like, I'll be happy to do that for you because um, the, the type of expert witnesses that uh, the, the attorney generals are looking for are, are sharp individuals because when we're at an administrative law judge hearing, um, the opposing defense attorneys, particularly down here in Southern California where I'm at, um, there's quite a few in particular that are very, very good and very, very sharp and smart. And they uh, have eviscerated some of our experts in the past. So I just thought I'd uh, bring that uh, information up to you. And also uh, uh, I, I gave the, uh, the board president some uh, sample test questions or sample questions just to uh, chew up a little bit with the uh, proposed experts to see how they would do on those uh, situations. So thank you for your time. All right. And the next request for comment is from Sarb Desi. So Sarb, you should be able to unmute yourself now. There you go. You're unmuted. Um, yeah. Good morning to the board. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sarb Dacey in Northern California. Um, I I kind of back up what Dr. Rake is saying here because I think having that kind of a training program and then also having the backup of some kind of a feedback system would be ideal for the reviewers. Coming from a different aspect of doing um, reviews for the board, it is a different beast and learning it is one way on your own. And now I know we have the train classes uh, in Northern and Southern, and that provided some outline, but ongoing feedback or ability to ask questions on certain cases, even if it's with other experts as a, as a reference would be ideal. And if we can make that part of the training program, I think that would go much further in developing the expert reviewers for the board. So we don't get put in these situations where we're not making the right comments or not looking at the right laws or regs. 
Um, so that was my comment, and I appreciate you guys uh, putting this together and trying to make this change going forward. I think it's a great idea. All right, and our next request for comment is from Lewis Meltz. Uh, Lewis, you should be able to unmute yourself. All right, Lewis, you're unmuted. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, well, in, in some of the courses I've done as a as a uh, vendor for continuing education, uh, a lot of the information that I do is, is specifically in law and ethics. A lot of the chiropractors in practice are unacquainted with this particulars and the nuances of the, of the code of regulations or the BNP code as they practice. They, they essentially forget it and uh, just go on to just become technicians in their interest in practice rather than adhering to laws. So my question is, when recruiting experts for the, the, the panel, what criteria will be used uh, to provide those that are interested to initially screen those that may be unqualified or ill-equipped to be a qualified expert for the issues that come up? Because Essentially, it, it concerns a person's livelihood when it, it, it concerns their license and their ability to continue practicing. So my question, the experts that you are recruiting, will there be an initial screening process to identify the qualifications and the credibility and the competence of those people that will be reviewing people's ability to you know, earn a future income when it concerns their license to practice? And that is the last request for comment on agenda item three. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay, thank you. Um, any further comment from the board first? Uh, hearing none, Dr. Adams, will you please call the vote? I, I, I apologize, I, I was just chiming in. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. So, so based on the last statement, so that brings up a good point, and that is that um, do we have a provision in there that perhaps, you know, our experts should be, you know, pertain, you know, uh, you know, advanced qualifications in certain areas. I mean, I'm thinking like orthopedics or pediatrics, depending upon what the, um, or neurology or, you know, extremities that depending on what the need is that they should have either a advanced certification um you know in that field and be current in that i think that would be something to consider um, based on what he he said i don't know that there's a I'm not aware of a advanced certification in in ethics or bnp practices but certainly somebody who's well versed in those areas are what we're looking for now. and i'm sure the staff has taken that into consideration but I think that's something to uh, to keep in mind that they had, you know, that they, if, you know, people that tend to do advanced certifications are usually people that are on top of their game, particularly when they're keeping it current um, due to the uh, requirements to maintain those uh, advanced certifications. We, we do, um, one of the questions we ask is, um, when we're recruiting is if the applicant has um, any specialties or advanced certifications. And we we do use that. We, we try to, um, when we have a case that we're investigating, to find an expert who has expertise in that area, you know, um, it's so they, they understand what they're reviewing. Um, we would like to have a more diverse with with more specialties and um, hopefully with our new recruitment process we'll we'll be able to um, attract uh, people with a variety of specialties so we can find the appropriate person for each case yeah, and I think the ongoing nature of you know recruitment and having an open uh, application period annually allows us to continually uh, kind of you know, how highly qualified, but really diverse within the profession, uh, you know, experts come forward and be utilized by the board. And then I would assume, uh, Robert, that we could put out a call if we have a, a certain need or a specific area of practice where we might be seeking 
Uh, yeah, certainly we could, um, in our recruitment materials, we could let um, licensees know that we need people with expertise in these areas and, um, you know, hopefully get some that um, that apply. And also, if we if we have more flexibility, we can do a focused um, recruitment for um, for a certain specialty so we can bring on somebody quickly if we have a case that requires um, special expertise in a certain area and we don't have somebody that fits the bill we could um, we could do a, a recruitment and hopefully bring somebody on board um, relatively quickly thank you and uh, I have a suggestion that I'm going to make in future agenda items uh, but regarding the feedback we got from the public today so um, thank you to all the um, doctors on there speaking. Moving forward here, um, Dr. Adams, can we call for a vote on the motion? Uh, on the motion of item agenda three about witness recruitment and selection, expert witness re recruitment and selection process, um, Dr. David Paris? Yes. Dr. Lawrence Adams? Yes. Mr. Raphael Sweet? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item four. Um, we're going to have a it's a review discussion possible action regarding the record keeping requirements for chiropractic patient records, uh, California Code of Regulations, uh, Title 16, Section 318. Uh, staff will give us a presentation on the current record keeping regulation and also as some examples of comparable record uh, regulations in Colorado and Texas. Uh, Robert, I'll hand it over to you. And Kristen, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the board's current record keeping regulation is, um, title, is California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 318, and it outlines the minimum requirements for documenting and maintaining chiropractic patient records. Um, however, it's the regulation itself is not very comprehensive when it comes to the content of the patient records, um, as it does not specify the necessary documentation for the patient history, complaint, diagnosis, analysis, and treatment, and it doesn't differentiate between an initial patient encounter and an established patient visit. As a result, um, the board's enforcement program often must rely on uh, the experts' opinions regarding the standard of care to support our inadequate record-keeping violations in many cases due to the fact that these, the record keeping requirement found in section 318 is not clearly expressed in the regulation. Um, at this meeting, um, in the meeting materials, we've included a copy of section 318, as well as some comparable regulations from Colorado and Texas for reference. And we're, um, staff is bringing this as an item for the committee for discussion, um, and whether you would like to consider amending um, section 318 at future in 2022. So we're bringing it forward just um, for the committee's discussion. If if they feel that um, the regulation isn't, you know, could use some improvements, and then we can um, dive into that further next year and work on developing some proposed language. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to the committee for discussion. Thank you. Any discussion from the board members? I have a I have a comment. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Adams. No, go ahead, Dr. Paris. Um, well, and I was one comment I have is that um, I think I'm supportive, and um, I think definitely this is something we should uh, work on and update the regulations. I'm I'm wondering if maybe um, we might be better served by looking at generally at least from the new patient. Um, evaluation and management uh, coding and look at the CMS documentation guidelines. Um, and those reflect generally from AMA CPT, the coding for a, which, you know, DCs generally bill and code and that that may be something that if we can have language that reflects um, because that was recently updated too. And so if we can reflect that language, it, it kind of makes it more of a, a living document and we're not really stuck in time 
like we are now with what we write today. And, and then we can also utilize that to determine um, kind of the baseline of, uh, you know, documentation requirements. Is it, that seems to be more of a, a broader standard. That would be my suggestion that we, we look at the CMS um, coding guides and determine, you know, where in the 99, they're the 9920 codes, um, but we, CPT codes, but we would kind of, we could look at those at a future meeting maybe and determine what level and all the, um, you know, we think the minimum should be, you know, in, in our regulation. Certainly, I mean, and we would, um, that would be something that we would rely heavily on the expertise of the licensee board members um, to let us know what would be um, appropriate and necessary to have um, in an initial examination and follow up examination, so on, so we can address that specifically. Because um, oftentimes we have thrown back at us, we take a case to hearing or so, you know, the, um, it, the issues raised that well the law doesn't say I have to do that and you know even though there is a standard of care that um, that isn't necessarily addressed in the law it would be nice to be as specific as we possibly can um, in the law so it's clear to licensees what is expected from the board hi this is a uh, board council I would also recommend to the committee members that it uh, directs staff to work with the board's regulation council on any proposed amendments to Title 16 CCR Section 318 um, before any proposed text is presented to the full board. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'm in agreement with uh, all that's been said uh, uh, in reading over the Colorado and Texas um, examples that you gave. Um, I think what you guys proposed as a staff and what you put together uh, was very clear. I've heard that a lot, you know, that uh, when in these some of these enforcement cases about record keeping that that uh, the SOAP note um, format is not codified, even though it's kind of implied it's taught in all the schools. <laughs> But when you go to when you go to enforcement aspects, it's like, well, but it's not. And that it, it seems like it should be more clear um, and not just assumed that it's tacit because you made an adjustment that you did all of those things. Um, so I, I think the layout and what's there is a great uh, template to move forward with. And uh, I'm in support of, uh, of moving forward with that. And I think um, Dr. Parrish's comment about CN, uh, the CMS, um, I, I think that that refers to what the Medicare and the federal aspect, David, as I, as I recall, what you're, is that the CMS guidelines for like the Medicare reporting? Well, it's not necessarily Medicare. So they have, and, and I can forward through Robert and get it to the board members. And, but they have, CMS has E&M documentation guidelines. And they're all the, like the 99201, 202, 202, yeah, 202 new, 202, new, new patient. Oh, yeah. Yes, new patient. Yeah, and, that, and that coding. basically goes with complexity, right? Yes. Right. So, yeah, I think that, and that's kind of tacit in there too. So, I think that's a, that'd be a good, a great guideline or suggestion as well. Yeah, um, I I do um, I do like the uh, the Texas follow up. Uh, a visit soap note. Uh, I kind of like the broader language that they use there, only because well, soap note tends to be the standard. If you're doing Medicare, people still do part, just as the acronyms, you know. Um, so that the, in, I don't know that I'd want us to um, necessarily uh, put mandate soap in a regulation. I mean, I think for the follow up visits, I think it can be something more like what we see in the Texas under F and those uh, six, um, six components that they identify. I think those are those are pretty comprehensive and any you note know, even not in a SOAP format. Uh, those would be, uh, those would do well to serve public protection, regardless of SOAP or part or even a narrative maybe, but. Agreed.
any other discussion uh, from the board? Moderator, can we open this for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am opening up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment regarding agenda item four, uh, regarding record keeping, uh, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, we have a request for comment from Dr. Philip Ray. So Dr. Philip, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panel. It's a great topic. Uh, this has been a uh, crawl on my side for quite some time. These archaic uh, 318 um, uh, requirements for record keeping, um, they're so outdated, they, they need to be updated. Um, these are some of the issues that uh, we run up against uh, when we, we try to uh, discuss uh, in court or trial, uh, particularly with SOAP notes. Um, I think the basic minimum recording requirements, uh, SOAP would be the would, would be one of the proper acronyms. And as we all know, now we're getting into SOAP, SOPIE, and other acronyms that are more intense in, 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 in detail. I have, I apologize, I have not seen the, the Texas uh, uh, requirements for, for record keeping but I will take a look at them. But uh, I, I think that uh, you're, in the, you're on the right ballpark here. You're, you're gonna have to increase uh, more detail with regards to um, the SOAP issues um, as they are, they are standard of care, but they're not codified. And um, those are some of the issues I think uh, the panel is addressing. So thanks again for going forward. All right, our next request for comment is from Dr. Brian Killeen. So uh, Brian, you may now unmute yourself, Dr. Colleen. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you, doctors, for the opportunity to uh, participate in this. Uh, as Dr. Rake said, I'm in total agreement that this whole process has to be revamped. And I agree with Dr. Adams with this discussion about whether or not something is codified. I've done work for the board for a number of years, and we have experts who show up on the opposite side of the uh, board defending the doctor whose uh, records are at issue, including former presidents of the state board who will use that expression all the time. The Title 16, it isn't codified, and therefore it's okay for what the doctor uh, did it, it, in his records. And I think there needs to be a distinction between what we call standard of care versus minimal levels of competency. And I think what Title 16 represents is a minimal level of competency for the doctor to go out in, in the world and practice as opposed to a standard of care. So when you're talking about including soap notes, soap notes are something that they're taught in chiropractic school, they're tested on in the clinic entrance exams, and that's considered the standard of care, but it's not codified within the uh, state board regulations. And we could we could go down the line and we could look at other things. For instance, we're trained in school that if you're doing an examination on a female, you should have one of your uh, female uh, workers in the same room with you. That's a standard of care issue, but we have doctors who have committed uh, infractions of the law and will say, well, since it wasn't codified and I was in the room alone, I didn't do anything wrong. So I think there needs to be a distinction between what the standard of care is, what you're trained and taught in school, and what's considered to be the standard of treating patients versus just what you find in Title 16. And that goes all the way up to advertising and what's improper advertising, et cetera. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and that is the last of the requests. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Please, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any further comment from uh, or discussion from the board members? And I do not believe there is a, a motion for us here. It was just for discussion. Correct. Hearing none, no further discussion. 
move on to agenda item number five. Review discussion and possible action regarding proposed statutory language to amend Business and Professions Code Section 1007, Subdivision C, specified exemptions to the patient notification requirement for licensees placed on probation by the board. And again, we're uh, board staff will give us a presentation um, regarding the proposed statutory language. And Robert, I'll pass it to you and you may pass it again, but that's okay. <laughs> Kristen. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, Senate Bill 1448, um, known as the Patients' Right to Know Act of 2018, um, required, um, applied to um, all to healing arts licensees, but then specific to our board, it added Business and Professions Code Section 1007, which requires licensees placed on probation by the board on or after July 1st, 2019, to provide a separate disclosure to their patients, uh, their, uh, notifying them of their um, probation status. And then within that statute, Business and Professions Code Section 1007, Subdivision C, specifies exemptions to this requirement. Um, but some of these exemptions appear to be overly broad and may apply more appropriately to other healing, um, healing arts licensees rather than um, doctors of chiropractic. And um, the enforcement unit is finding that due to the broad nature of these exemptions, um, they can be misused by licensees to avoid notifying their patients of their probationary status. Um, so what staff has, present, has presented um, to the committee uh, for review is we have some proposed statutory language to remove some of the exemptions um, from Business and Professions Code Section 1007 uh, that would apply only to doctors of chiropractic. And we're requesting that the committee um, discuss the exemptions as proposed um, and provide staff with some guidance um, as well as to um, other situations that it may not that may not apply to doctors of chiropractic. And then um, if the committee agrees, we would um, request that they recommend to the full board that we include this proposal as an in our new issue section of the sunset review report for the legislature's review. Thank you. Any discussion from the board members? So go ahead, Dr. Adams. No, okay, sorry. I saw you move. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I had I had no comment. I, I, okay. When I read it, I thought, well, it seems reasonable that if someone's on probation, I always, you know, I mean, it, it, I think anything that clarifies is, is, uh, is, is good. So I think this clarifies things and and makes it uh, less uh, for people to abuse, you know, language that's not clear. So I have a I I have a question. I'm I'm as I sat and read this, I'm I was wondering to myself. I was trying to think of the situations where, you know, disclosing would be impossible or unreasonable. And I had a hard time thinking of very many. Um, and and then when I read the, the initial four, and I agreed with all the strike through language, and I think um, maybe, maybe we could use even more uh, strike through, or can we can we have a discussion about the situations where disclosure wouldn't be possible? I'm, I'm trying to envision the case or the scenario where a chiropractor is is treating an unconscious patient or is unable to provide disclosure. I mean, even in an emergency room, maybe the busyness of it. And um, but I'm, I mean, absent a true medical emergency requiring some sort of life saving, you know, heroic efforts or an intubated patient, or um, I'm trying to think of a patient in an emergency room. And, and it does, I will acknowledge there are chiropractors embedded into formal emergency rooms, which I think we should maybe define that too. Um, and, but I'm trying to think of the scenario where the chiropractor and his scope of practice will be utilized, but but still unable to 
provide disclosure. So I'm wondering if if they're really if it's even reasonable uh, for us to have any exceptions in our language. I mean, is would it be reasonable for us to just strike C altogether? feedback on that staff board members I will add the one the one thing I I do think we might identify is and I had a hard time thinking of the licensee chiropractic uh, doctor of chiropractic does not have a direct treatment relationship with the patient um, I think we should maybe discuss and define what that really means or the intent. My impression was that maybe that was somebody doing an evaluation uh, like IME, QME, where you're, there's no anticipation of providing treatment. Um, but I do think you're still performing evaluation and management and generally writing a report in that scenario. And I think there's no reason why you couldn't provide disclosure. So unless there's another situation um, where the licensee would be directly dealing with the patient. And I know, um, Kristen, can you give us the example of like the group practice? Um, yeah, we were, one thought on that would be um, it's a group practice setting and um, you have three chiropractors, only one of them is on probation and they each maintain their separate patient pools. Um, it wouldn't be necessary for the other two um, chiropractor's patients to know that the third chiropractor's on probation because they have no treatment relationship. But then looking at this closer, that person also wouldn't be that person's patient. So um, I think I think your thought on the QME where they're not actually treating the patient, they're just performing an evaluation may be um, pretty, pretty close in line with what the intention is here. Um, but I agree with you that um, I don't, personally see where um, where there would be any harm in letting the patient know, even if it's just an evaluation that the person performing the evaluation is on probation. I, I think it would be a matter of is is the treatment necessary immediately and is is disclosure impossible? And, you know, so we have to look at that um, you know, and what is the likelihood of a licensee um, needing to treat somebody in an emergency situation where um, there's no alternative but for them to treat the person and um, they, for some reason, um, disclosure is impossible. And so that, that sets the bar pretty high. And um, if there are those situations, we wanna, um, we wanna be able to allow for them. But if not, then, um, I agree, perhaps we could just um, strike out all of C. Hi, this is Board Council. I, I think if you propose just kind of striking out any statutory exemption, the likelihood of success on that is probably minimal. Um, I, I think if you want to further define um, certain situations where this may not apply, it's probably more appropriate to do in regulation rather than through a, a statutory amendment. Uh, that's just kind of my thought on that. If I can just clarify, I, you know, one of the things, I mean, I, fortunately, I think these things are going to be rare. Um, kind of like your point out, David, that situations where a chiropractor is going to be in a certain emergency like that, where they're going to be providing care. But but the group setting, um, Kristen, when you brought that up, um, you know, I'm in a group practice with other chiropractors and I go on vacation and my patients are seen by another doctor in that practice, even though that may be my patient. Um, that patient might be seen. So are you saying that in that setting, if, if you know, another chiropractor in my office is on probation, I go on vacation and I, you know, refer or that patient comes in on an emergency while I'm gone, are you saying that's a time where that doctor does not have to disclose or they do have to disclose to to a patient that they are seeing that they don't necessarily have a former relationship other than that context of uh, an emergency visit while I'm gone on vacation. Um, 
Is that, is that, am I getting that clear? I, I think um, it's, it's not clear whether because of this exemption, because the, the other doctor should notify the patient or the office should notify the patient. Dr. Adams isn't available. You can see Dr. Smith. However, Dr. Smith is on probation and just, you know, we have to disclose that. Um, so, but the, um, the exception or exemption may be misinterpreted or misused in, in that situation. So that's, um, you know, in, in our opinion, um, the licensee should disclose, if they're treating a patient, right. even if it's not their own patient, um, they should disclose that. And right. So you're saying you're trying to narrow that, you're trying to close that so that that, that type of thing doesn't happen. Correct. Yeah, because yeah. I can see abuse on that. If you have a, a lead doctor that's selling a practice, for instance, right? And, you know, he brings in an associate. The associate has an issue with the board, is on probation for, and then he's seeing the patients of the guy who owns the practice, who's kind of, you know, stepping out of his practice and he starts having this other person see all of his patients. I guess you're saying that, you know, some guy could kind of, you know, fudge that a little bit and not share that information. And you're saying we got to narrow that or close that. So that person has to disclose that to anybody he sees or she sees. Is that why, why you're kind of narrowing it in a sense, trying to clarify Correct. it? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I see that. That's a more common thing than I think, you know, someone's incapacitated and can't, can't be informed of it. I think that's going to be pretty rare. Any further discussion from the board members? Anything else from staff? Moderator, can we open this uh, for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am opening up the Q&A panel, and if any member of the public would like to make a comment on agenda item five, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, this is a moderator. I see no request for comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please, thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. We Yes, we do. I just am not waiting long enough, I apologize. So Nick, okay. you are able to unmute yourself or you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go, you're unmuted. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm here. Uh, to discuss the importance of the CE requirements. I know that's not what we're talking about right now, but um, hoping that we can get that on the agenda for next meeting. Uh, this is the moderator. We do have uh, future agenda items coming up. So if you wanna wait and save your comment oh, for that. I'm so sorry about that. No worries. All right, so uh, we truly can uh, close public comment if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Okay. It's and, and I would note um, agenda item number eight is future agenda items for anybody um, on the call today. We'd be happy to hear from everybody on future agenda items when we get there. Is there any additional public comment? No, that was all. So board members, I think now would be a time um, to make a motion to approve staff's recommendations on the proposed statutory amendments to business and professions code section 1007, subdivision C. I think we were offering up some suggestions. I, didn't, I don't know that we were as, as written I think, I think we if I may, it, 
if I may, it sounds like from the discussion and maybe some of the guidance from um, our legal counsel, uh, Jason, that um, maybe the committee would want to, um, with the proposed language that's in place, um, keep the scenario of the unconscious patient and the emergency room, and then that could be further defined through regulation. But it sounded like um, the committee also, in addition to what's already been um, struck in the proposed language, also remove um, the last item, the licensee does not have a direct treatment relationship with the patient. Um, is that what you were thinking? Uh, well, I, I pondered the option of having us strike C. And I know Mr. Hurtado had mentioned might be another, might need to uh, do that a different way or that might not be possible. Um, either way, um, because I I agree with um, Jason that that we may not be successful in making a legislative change. Um, however, I think either way we would want to bring this up in sunset since this um, this statute was created by the legislature and it was kind of a one size fits all for health professions. And so um, I, I don't know if they would be amenable to car, you know, making some changes um, specific to this board since they they did put this in the provisions relating only to chiropractors. Um, and, you know, and if not, then we we can certainly pursue this through regulations. Um, so but but we can address it um, with the legislature joint sunset. OK. So uh, I will make a motion to recommend to the full board that it include this proposal uh, with Ms. Walker's edits as noted in the new issues section of the board sunset review report. Is that OK? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Robert. Oh, no, that's OK. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Raphael, sweet. Any further discussion? And Mr. Hurtado, do we need to open back up to public comment now that there's a motion? Um, we could just check one final time. Okay. Moderator, can we open up for public comment, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've opened up the Q&A panel again. And just a reminder, this is for agenda item five. So if you have a comment on agenda item five, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. take some of the other um, proposals back to the committee for further discussion. Um, looking specifically at um, the different packages that we would be proposing to do with the six, um, looking at the petition process, I imagine that's one where um, we're, we're redefining um, the way the petition process would work in regulation. And then we're also incorporating by reference some forms that petitioners will be using. So that's one where I specifically imagine that we will need to um, have further committee review and discussion before we can move that one forward. But then we have some others where um, we're just looking to make changes to things such as the practice locations and notification requirements that could probably be addressed um, faster at just, you know, through one more meeting. Um, so at this meeting, all the staff is requesting is that the committee um, discuss our proposal to take um, the package, the CPEI package that we have and divide it into six smaller packages um, as outlined in uh, the meeting packet. And if you agree, uh, we would request that you um, consider making a motion to the board to approve the plan. Any discussion from the board members? Thank you, Ms. Walker. Uh, 
I have a comment. I think um, I like it and I, I think it makes it really um, kind of digestible, not just for the board members, but um, even for the public and the licensees. And um, I think we've seen in the past these things get unwieldy when they're one big. They're all combined together and nothing moves forward and instead of moving portions of this forward. So um, I would call for a motion to approve uh, the staff plan and to allow them to work with legal counsel to develop and update the proposed language um, for each of the regulation packages and present those back to the committee for review and discussion at a future meeting. I second that motion. Any further discussion from the board members? No, I agree. I think it. I think it does make it easier for us to uh, to understand and to to uh, make decisions based on the six six, six smaller regulation packages versus uh, one large one. So I agree with Dr. Paris. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. Any other discussion from the board members? Moderator, can we open for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am opening up the Q&A panel. And if any member of the public would like to make a comment on agenda item six, please type comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are uh, displaying instructions for your reference and we'll give you a moment. I see no request for comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Please, thank you. You're welcome. Um, hearing no further discussion or comment, Dr. Adams, can you please call for the vote? Yes. In the matter of agenda item six, item A, Dr. Paris? Yes. Lawrence Adams? Yes. Mr. Raphael Sweet? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Moving on to item 6B, the board's disciplinary guidelines and model disciplinary orders and implementation of the uniform standards for substance abusing licensees, California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 384. And again, I will pass it to Ms. Walker for a presentation from staff regarding the update. Thank Thank you. Um, for the past several years, the board's been working on updates to the disciplinary guidelines and model disciplinary orders and the implementation of the uniform standards for substance abusing licensees. Uh, the board previously voted on the trigger language for the application of the uniform standards and decided on um, what was presented as the third option, which is finding evidence establishing that the licensee is a substance abusing licensee after providing them with notice and conducting a hearing. Um, Based on that decision, board has been the board staff has been working on the regulation package to not only make updates to the disciplinary guidelines, specifically the um, standard and optional conditions of probation, and then also the language for implementing those uniform standards based on that approved trigger language. Um, However, upon review of the package, um, there's still a little bit more work that needs to be done on the proposed language. So this is primarily just an update item to let the committee know that um, staff is I'm going to be collaborating with uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, Regulatory Council so that we can make um, what will hopefully be the, um, the necessary updates and revisions that we need to make um, to be able to move forward with this package. And our plan is to present that to the committee um, for further review and discussion in 2022. Thank you. Any questions or discussion from the board members? Hearing none, uh, moderator, can we open this up for public comment? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am opening up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item 6B, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. I see no request for comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Walker, for that update. I don't believe you, you do not, you're not requesting or you don't need any uh, emotion or anything from us on that issue. Just the update. Correct. Right. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number seven. Public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, if I can interrupt, I, I think this would be the appropriate time for anybody who wants is um, attending to make comments about CE requirements to um, make their comments. Um, and for, I, from the ones we've heard already, the gist of it is that um, they want to see the um, the matter of virtual CE for the um, meeting the requirement for in-person CE um, placed on an agenda at a future board meeting. So um, in the interest of brevity, if, if that's what you're um, proposing, if you could uh, make your comment, um, you know, introduce yourself, you, you don't have to state your name, but if you'd like to state your name for the record and, and just um, state that you would like to see that item on the agenda at a future board meeting. Because um, um, agenda item eight here, future agenda items, that's for this committee, and that's not something that would be discussed at this committee. So, um, so now is the time for for the public to comment on um, CE or any other things they would like to address here. Thank you, Mr. Pulio. Moderator, can we open up for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've opened up the Q&A panel, and if any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item seven, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. We are displaying instructions, and we have Marcus Strutz that would like to make a comment. So Marcus, you should be able to unmute yourself. All right, we'll try that again. Marcus, you should be able to unmute yourself. And it looks like Marcus is having difficulty unmuting himself again. All right, so we will uh, move on to- a um, Trisha, I'm sorry, uh, um, I see comments. Oh, there we there go. We go. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, good morning. This is Marcus Strutz with Back to Chiropractic Seminars, and I apologize for cutting in earlier. I thought that was our opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, we were uh, requesting not just myself, but uh, 32 CE providers and about 8,000 chiropractors that have communicated with me. We have hundreds of letters. So I'm just the one singular spokesperson. Uh, we are requesting that this become an agenda item uh, at the next meeting, and also that we have a longer period of time to talk, uh, two minutes, and that's why I'm going so fast. Uh, we request that we have uh, a longer period, five minutes, 10 minutes, so we can go into in-depth uh, explanation of what's going on here. Uh, the letter I've written to the, uh, Robert Puglio, who I believe has advanced it to all the board members, goes on and on and on with hundreds of testimonials attendance issues, lawsuit concerns, going back. I mean, we're here, we were having meetings for safety purposes over phones and the DCA is postponing stuff because of COVID, yet they're asking us to go back to live seminars in January where we have a super high percentage chance of getting sick and or dying. And who's responsible for all that? These are all the questions I'm getting daily. Um, so really hope the board will do exactly what I'm hearing today, which is taking one small part of the rules and regulations and looking at that one part and then acting immediately as fast as possible. Um, and that way we can either gain some time to get this push through the OAL um, and do the right thing. And simply what I'm hearing all the constituents of uh, licensees asking for is simply a choice. 
I'm not demanding that it be one way or the seconds. other. So thank you. And then um, just endless letters from people who are so super concerned um, as, as am I. So um, yes, we wanted this to be on the agenda for uh, the next meeting and or a, an earlier meeting because it's so unbelievably important. And there is a huge time factor on this of December 31st, which is just four weeks away. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. All right, we have VJ making a request for comment. VJ, you should be able to unmute yourself. VJ, you're unmuted. Yes, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, I've been getting um, some letters from Dr. Marcus Strutz, um, his concerns about the CE. Um, seminars and so far it's been a great success. I really enjoy having to do this. It is um, so convenient and also um, able to you know squeeze it in with my busy schedule. So I really do hope that you would consider this and that we will continue to do virtual um, seminars for our CU requirements. Um, that's all I needed to um, to speak on. Thank you so much for your time. All right, and the next Thank request. You. Or comment is from Nick Campos. So Nick, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you Thank go. you. Good good morning again. And and I just want to reiterate what what Dr. Strutz is uh, presenting to the board that uh, the, this issue is of of mega importance um, for all the reasons he's stating and he's provided uh, in his in his uh, written report. And so um, hopefully we can get this on the the agenda for the next meeting. And then we have a request for comment from Cliff Tao. So Cliff, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Cliff, there you go. To confirm my audio? Yes. Hi, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for this meeting. I just want to echo the same sentiment that uh, Nick Campos did uh, with Marcus Strutz and Victor Tong. I uh, would like to have this uh, CE issue on the next board meeting's agenda. And also would like to add, I, I think the concern is uh, if known, or I guess if, if not obvious, I think the concern is for public safety. Uh, of course, of our chiropractors attending the meetings, but um, you know we, we can potentially be infected and infect our patients in our offices. So uh, if not obvious that that's the, I think the main concern that we should uh, make obvious. Thank you. All right, this is a moderator, and that was the last of requests for comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Moving on to agenda item number eight, future agenda items. And again, this is to decide whether or not to place a, a matter for the enforcement committee um, on the agenda of a future meeting. Anything from the board members here? Um, I have one. I would like to see a future agenda item, uh, a discussion and uh, of us doing some public sessions and receiving uh, a little more time uh, for some feedback and input um, on the uh, expert recruitment program from the public and our licensees. Anything else from the board members? Moderator, can we open this to the public? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item eight, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, we have a request for comment from Lewis Meltz. And uh, Lewis, you have been unmuted, or you, 
you can unmute yourself. Thank you so much. I'd like to reiterate Dr. Rake's request that those that have been experienced in the past uh, as experts and has, have uh, successfully uh, completed cases to the um, um, successful completion, that you rely on those of us that have had experience uh, to be part of the evaluation process to offer our expertise and our experience rather than relying on, on um, people have not ever done uh, case review. But uh, there are certainly uh, num a lot of us that are willing to help and assist the board in promulgating questions, criteria, interview questions and process to assist the board uh, for a complete process for, for new examinees and having a, a good process in which we can follow up from. All right, this is a moderator and I see no further requests for comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything else from the board members or staff? So maybe a quick clarification question for me. Um, this is an enforcement um, meeting. And so this particular agenda item eight is referring to enforcement um, agenda items in relationship to item seven when there were comments brought up and let me know if this is not a pro i just don't know how how do we address the public questions or or concerns that they voiced pertaining to that issue um for a future meeting how does that how does that happen i know contextually it's not associated with this particular meeting because there was no comment or discussion after public comment. Dr. Adams, this is board council. Um, th the item would need to be agendized at a future meeting for the for the full board or for an enforcement committee to discuss and kind of deliberate on the on the issues. OK, so you have to do that at a. At a at a next meeting. Yes, it would have to be agendized. So uh, for purposes of today's meeting, you know, the, the comments that were presented by members of the public um, had not been properly agendized. So the board could not take any action or, or discuss right. it other than just kind of field, you know, public comment. Okay, I got you. Just thought I was clear. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Anything else from committee members or staff? Okay, hearing nothing, I have uh, 1025 and I will, if I could get a entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This is Raphael Sweet, I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, we will adjourn at 1026. We need to vote on that. Oh, sorry. Oh, not not for adjournment. Yeah, I don't think adjournment. Yeah, we can. <laughs> we can. Um, hearing no disagreement with adjournment. Um, thank you, everybody. I have 1026 and uh, thank you to the public. And uh, there was a lot of participation today and we appreciate that. and We value your feedback and your comments. Um, so thank you very much and thank you to the board members and thank you to staff. Have a good day, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.